I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management in Wealth and Fiduciary Services. Today's video is going to take a look at market volatility. We're going to look at what's driving it, some key points to keep in mind, and educate you on potential opportunities and the way to keep a long-term view. Let's get right into it and just to cover what exactly is driving ongoing market weakness. I think these are well known to many of you. However, it's important to reiterate High and stubborn inflation is driving equity market weakness. It's been driven by a strong economic recovery, record stimulus, and then more recently war in Ukraine and supply constraints have added to upward price pressures. If that's not enough, the Fed has remained resolute and wants to proceed on raising interest rates. And they are also going to start QT or quantitative tightening, which is a process of letting their bonds run off and mature without reinvestment. In short, the Fed remains very hawkish, which is language for saying they remain focused on raising interest rates. And even in the most recent week, their language has indicated that they will continue to raise interest rates to bring inflation down, even if there is some damage to the economy. That certainly has not helped. Uh, lockdowns in China as a result of a COVID outbreak, although the news is getting better there, that is also adding to supply constraints as ports remain congested and unable to unload uh, shipments for the rest of the world. And then all of that is coinciding with, or all of it is leading to rather recession risks. At what point do higher prices impact consumer spending and impact corporate profits? Recent earnings reports have increased their mention of inflation and specific earnings reports have really been negative and adding to investor fear. So all of that is the backdrop and likely won't become much clearer or will persist over the near term. So let's take a look. How bad is it in terms of the market? Well, 2022 is off to the fourth worst start ever for a calendar year in the equity market. Through May 15 was down 15.1%. You can see the top 10 worst starts to a year. What happens after that? Well, if it's any gauge, the prior other uh, nine instances here saw a gain of almost 10% between the middle of May and the rest of the year. So some optimism for additional gains. However, not all of those occurrences were positive. Full year returns, however, were still negative, meaning that the improvement from here on out through the rest of the year did not offset early year returns. Let's go one further and put it into a perspective on how far this decline has uh, has gone this year. As of the beginning, or as of May 15, we had a 16% decline. Uh, the S&P at, at its worst was down 18% year to date. You can see that on the far right of this chart, which shows the calendar year return for the S&P 500, a proxy for the US stock market. And the red dots represent the maximum intra-year decline. The green line represents the average decline. And you can see again that this year's decline already has exceeded the average decline of any given calendar year. On the positive, uh, is the, although we have declines every year or almost every year, the equity markets finish higher 75% of the time. And while that might not be the case this year, it's important to keep in mind as you should have a long-term view on your investment portfolio. So already one of the worse than average in terms of a decline. Let's take a look at how bad could it get? Uh, and let's put see if the scenario gets worse from here. On this chart, we show all of the bear markets or near bear markets since the end of, the, since 1950 through the current. And you can see that there have been 15 bear markets or near bear markets, and we show the duration, the recovery date, and the time to recover from all of those bear markets. We also list on the far right if there was a recession involved with that decline. On average, this decline has worked out to a dec of almost 30% decline. If you're a NASDAQ investor, NASDAQ's already down almost 27%. The S&P, again, down close to 18%. The duration, uh, on average, was 11 months. Uh, currently, we're at a five-month duration on the current sell-off in the equity market. Time to recover, it's taken two and a half years to recoup those declines. That might seem like a long time, but if your horizon is 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 or longer, it certainly is a very small period of time. However, it's worth noting whether this sell-off is associated or a recession comes about. Uh, the recession-related decline is worse, down almost 37%, and the duration is a little longer, down uh, lasting 16 months. 
and the time to recover is a little longer, 3.6 years. The non-recession average, a little more mild, down 23, and we're pretty close to that already, seven month duration. So if the economy does not fall into recession, you have to be of the opinion that we are pretty close or have certainly borne out a lot of the decline already and important to stick with an investment plan over the longer term. I'll get to that more in a moment. And the time to recover is obviously quicker if it's a non-recession average, 1.4 years. So it could get worse, could turn into one, a traditional full-blown bear market. Again, we've progressed quite a bit of the way there. There's been a lot of pain in the market. This is a frustrating time, but it is also important to keep in mind some important long-term reminders for investing. And let's start with a long-term view. This is the S&P 500, and certainly over time, the S&P 500 has overcome market sell-offs going all the way back to 2008 and 2009, actually started 2009, you can see the various pullbacks and corrections over time in the shading there and the type there indicates what it was in response to a variety of triggers for market weakness. But over time, the S&P 500, the US stock market has overcome those sell offs and moved higher. If we look at bear markets, they are certainly painful. This is never fun to live through a, a, a severe sell-off. However, it's important to keep in mind that new bull markets more than make up for those declines. You can see in the orange and red there that the decline and then the blue represents the new bull market from the bottom to the next leg up in the market. Those bull markets have more then made up for the declines. The average return in a bull market over 200%, whereas the average bear market down 38% over that period, looking at these more severe bear markets. So bull markets do overcome those losses. Let's look at it another way and focus on markets being resilient. And in this chart show a lot of corrections going all the way back to the 1920s. Similar to the data I showed before the sell off and the recovery again an average duration of 11 months at the bottom there and just over about two years if we use the data from pre 1950 see the decline more importantly I wanted to focus on the right side of this chart if you purchased at the peak prior to the decline what would your investment results have been and for the most part your results are still pretty good average return over five years of 4.1 and over 10 years, 8% annualized. 4.1 may not seem like a lot for five years. That's certainly below average for the average equity market return, but certainly argues for staying invested and that investors do recoup over time. And it's also a reminder that if you are going to buy stocks, you do have to have that long-term view. So for the most part, uh, history has borne out that very negative, very rare negative cases over five and 10 years, and that ultimately investors do recoup after those declines if they were so unlucky to have purchased at the very peak. Let's look at missing the best days. Always an important reminder to stay invested, not try to time the market. It's impossible. That's where we see investors get hurt and lead to weaker returns. Even missing just a few of the best days can bring down your total return. Here we're showing data from 2000 to 2020. Uh, what was a fully invested 7.5% return drops to just over five if you miss the five best days. And you can see how it continues to degrade with missing more and more of the market updates. What makes this hard is some of that, some of the market's best updates often come after some of the biggest declines. Now, there is a silver lining to this, and I know it's hard to think about that currently, but it, it, as an investor, you have to think about the potential opportunities, and let's discuss some of those in the market. First and foremost, forward returns following market declines are always stronger. Uh, if you look at the decline from the peak uh, on the left, the greater the decline, the greater the subsequent market returns after that. So certainly after a bear market, even after one year, average returns fairly strong and certainly above average. And after three and 10 years, that data further improves as well. Those are good long-term returns and something to keep in mind for investors. So again, markets do recover. And after the current sell-off here in 2022, the valuation on the broad US stock market as measured by the S&P 500 is back to its 10-year average. And we're using the PE ratio. So the selling uh, coupled in the market or in the market coupled with 
still strong earnings has led to basically a normal valuation or certainly a normal valuation that we've seen over the past 10 years a forward PE ratio of right at 18. So uh, valuations back to normal and a positive going forward. In the bond market, we've seen a spike in interest rates and although pressure will likely remain near term on bonds, we've seen some signs of stabilization. This is a sensitivity analysis showing a change in the 10-year treasury yield and its corresponding total return to the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. I circled the down half a percent interest rate scenario to show that even if rates come down a half a percent, that translates into just over a 5% return. That assumes a one-year holding period, parallel shift of the yield curve, and no reinvestment of interest income. Obviously, if rates rise, there's still downward pressure on the bond market, but it goes to show you if we do have a recession, I think, or even a significant slowdown, you should see some support for bonds to offset some of that equity market weakness on a go forward basis. And on that note, it's important to realize the bond market's really gone a long way to price in Fed rate hikes, one of the biggest drivers of current weakness. So although bonds have not helped in diversification, we think that that changes going forward. The two lines there on the right show the futures implied path of the target Fed funds rate. Uh, in April, it showed the Fed stopping at about three and three eighths on the overnight rate in early 2023. And by the middle of May, that has topped out at about 3%. So the market, I think getting comfortable or getting used to the idea of Fed rate hikes, and that has helped the bond market, not the equity market, but certainly helped the bond market. And we think that all of those rate hikes priced in means that bonds could offer some better opportunity. Uh, the average yield in the high yield market now up over seven. Uh, AAA tax exempt yields in the 10 year space now exceeding three, which creates a nice taxable equivalent yield over five. So we're starting to see pockets of opportunity, certainly in the bond market, and as mentioned, uh, valuations in the equity market back to a 10 year average. So those are our thoughts on market volatility, some key reminders, and obviously silver lining or opportunities for investors to think about. This is a very difficult time. Important to keep that in mind if you're a long-term investor and try to think about the opportunities going forward. I'm Anthony Valeri. Thanks for listening.